We once worried about living in a surveillance society, a world where Big Brother was always watching us. Now it seems we are only too happy to put ourselves under constant surveillance, with the online world continually encouraging us to broadcast ourselves. This apparent obsession with self-display appears to have reached a point where being watched is no longer the problem. It's not being watched that we fear the most. As Tanya Butcher puts it, in Facebook there is not so much a threat of visibility as there is a threat of invisibility. The problem, as it appears, is not the possibility of constantly being observed, but the possibility of constantly disappearing. Welcome to Generation Me, the age of digital exhibitionism. Just look around and you will see millions of individuals caught in the glare of their own image on screen, seemingly blind to the real world around them. No wonder some people are calling the selfie stick the narcissistic. We all seem to be falling under the hypnotic spell of our own digital reflection. But does this account of selfie culture really explain what is happening? Or is it possible that this constant reproduction of the self is only part of some larger technological transformation at work? One which we are yet to fully comprehend. Could this fascination with our electronic self-reflection actually be preparing us to meet our future selves? This current obsession with broadcasting the self could be revealing something profound about our changing relationship with the media. To understand this, it is important to recognise the journey which the screen has been on for well over a century. One which has seen it gradually move ever closer to the viewer. As Sean Cubitt observes, From the far end of the hall in cinema to the corner of the living room with television, now computer screens sit a matter of inches from our faces and third screen devices like video iPods and mobile phones are even closer, more like clothing than familiar media. P. David Marshall illustrates this trend through the rapid transformation of the video game, one which has steadily evolved from publicly accessible arcades to home televisions to handheld Game Boys. This is not merely a cosmetic shift in viewing habits, for these changes in perspective could drastically alter not only how we see the screen, but also how we see ourselves, each other and the world around us. Critics have argued that the way we traditionally watch TV and the cinema tended to turn us into electronic voyeurs. Sitting motionless and at a distance, we peer into the screen, much like James Stewart's character as he furtively spies on his neighbours in rear window. It is around this very notion that film critic Laura Mulvey famously wove her feminist critique of classical Hollywood cinema, arguing that the light and shade of the screen, when contrasted with the darkness of the auditorium, created a voyeuristic separation between the spectator and the spectacle. If, however, as Steve Neal suggests, Voyeuristic looking is marked by the extent to which there is a distance between spectator and spectacle. Then a new understanding of the mediated gaze needs to be developed as that distance gradually dissolves. Rather than viewers adopting the position of an illicit voyeur passively coveting distant objects, digital users now actively interact with personal devices which they can carry, touch and even wear. This then fundamentally alters our relationship with the screen. It is an altogether more tactile and intimate experience. It was precisely this connection with the screen that science fiction writer William Gibson tried to capture with the term cyberspace, 
which he first coined after watching teenagers become immersed in arcade video games in the 1980s. Even in this very primitive form, he has said, the kids who were playing them were so physically involved, it seemed to me that what they wanted was to be inside the games. New computer technology would take this form of participation onto another level, eventually allowing the user to see themselves reflected in the screen. With the arrival of the selfie, webcam and live stream, the viewer ceases to be a passive observer and takes control over the reproduction of their own image. As Hilly Koskela explains, webcams can be interpreted as a form of confrontation, surveillance turned into spectacle, a form of resistance. Webcams clearly support active agency. What, how and when is presented is controlled by the persons whose images are circulated. Seen in this light, digital self-filming becomes a way of reclaiming the gaze, so it remains primarily under the power of the producer. In many ways, writes Brooke A. Knight, this exposure of the self shifts the surveillance model. Those being seen control what is to be seen. This then enables the spectator to form a more empowering relationship with the screen, turning the passive voyeur into an active exhibitionist, a shift in viewing dynamics that could eventually enable a greater level of self-reflection to take place. Charles Halton Cooley's concept of the looking glass self could support such an idea. Cooley argues that our notion of self-identity is partly the result of seeing ourselves reflected in others. Seen in this context, this type of digital self-reflexivity may well end up playing a crucial role in helping us to shape our own personal sense of identity. For Michael Wesch, sites like YouTube provide the ultimate social mirror, the mirror of all mirrors. But the implication of this technological shift could go even further. This current obsession with self-photography means that there is a continual implosion taking place between spectator and spectacle. Not only is the screen getting physically closer to the viewer, but their image is now increasingly becoming part of it. As Andrew L. Mendelssohn and Zizi Papacharissi put it, these metaphotographs demonstrate the manner in which the camera becomes an extension of the body further blurring the line between producer and subject. In this way, selfie culture could be helping us to rethink important aspects of our digital lives. Not only is it informing our own sense of self, but it is also preparing us for a world where the distance between viewer and screen could gradually melt away altogether. Although the screen has moved ever closer to the viewer, we are still clearly separated from it. In order to interact with a tablet, smartphone or even a smart watch, you still need to hold or wear it at a relative distance. This is precisely what so many cultural commentators criticise about our current media age, condemning these new mobile screens for keeping us trapped inside our own digital bubbles. With our attention forever focused on the screen in our hands, we exist, as Sherry Turkle puts it, alone together. But this may no longer be the case as technology develops. The move towards voice-activated devices is already helping to free our hands from having to constantly touch a device. New head-mounted computer technology will take this act of liberation even further by enabling the screen to move closer to the face and allowing the viewer to be online while simultaneously meeting the gaze of others. Of course, products like Google Glass have had problems, but it is likely that these will eventually be overcome as the technology improves and people become more accustomed to their use. Over time, they may even be replaced by computer contact lenses which would allow the individual to see mediated images float directly in front of them. 
Eventually, a virtual retinal display or implant could be scanned or injected into the eye or body, doing away with the need for any wearable technology at all. Such advancements may seem scary to us now, but we will slowly come to accept them and gradually take for granted the ability they give us to seamlessly move from real to mediated space in the blink of an eye. No longer located at the far end of the hall, the corner of the living room, or even worn like clothing, there will be no discernible trace left of the screen at all. This is what J. David Bolter and Richard Grusen refer to as the interfaceless interface. A form of technology where the user will move through space interacting with objects naturally as she does in the physical world. This then is the point at which the screen and the viewer will eventually converge. Let's explore the world all around us with this new lens and understand the computer world from a brand new perspective. We can already detect this sort of convergence in aspects of virtual reality, a type of screenless screen which will soon become so immersive, interactive and three-dimensional that it will increasingly appear like the real world. Augmented reality may take this level of convergence even further. As imagined in sci-fi movies like Minority Report and Iron Man, AR will project 3D holographic images directly into an observer's field of vision. This means that while virtual reality may offer a wholly simulated world that you can choose to enter or exit, augmented reality could become a constant state of existence. Just like the fictional hero in iBoy, who accidentally has part of his iPhone embedded in his brain, the real and the virtual will begin to permanently merge together. In time, this convergence of the self of the screen might become so intense that it will be increasingly impossible to differentiate between the two. All experience would be entangled in a hybrid region or ecotone between real and mediated space. Such a condition, of course, shares crucial similarity with Jean Baudrillard's notion of the hyperreal a state in which it will be impossible to distinguish reality from a simulation of reality. This is a world where the screen would eventually disappear altogether. For Baudrillard, there is no longer a medium in the literal sense. It is now intangible, diffused and diffracted in the real. In such a world, the spectator will have finally entered the frame and become part of the spectacle. This complete convergence of the self with the screen will eventually produce a new way of seeing and interacting with the world, a form of ontology or state of being. As filmmaker Chris Milk explains, what you're talking about at some point is more than a medium, but is fundamentally an alternative level of human consciousness. So how will this fusion between the self and the screen help to reshape us and the world we live in? Immersive reality is currently focused on gaming, but it will soon enter all aspects of our lives. Founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has recently spent $2 billion acquiring Oculus VR, a leader in virtual reality technology. VR has gone from being the science fiction dream to an awesome reality. And now we all here have a chance to change the way that we all play, communicate and collaborate. Augmented reality will further transform the very nature of the spaces we occupy and what we will be able to do in them and with them. In time, we will become so integrated with this new hybrid form of perception that it will no longer be sufficient to say that we are online. We will be, as Luciano Floridi puts it, on life. According to Steve Mann and Hal Nizviecki, it is at this moment that smart technology will be replaced by smart people. This will be, they say, 
accomplished metaphorically and actually through a prosthetic transformation of the body into a sovereign space, in effect allowing each and every one of us to control the environment that surrounds us. Such changes could gradually produce a post-human or cyborg environment, where man and machine would gradually merge. This, of course, conjures up a disturbing scenario. Countless sci-fi fictions have turned the cyborg into a nightmarish vision of emotionless robots driven only by logic. But if you have ever worn glasses, a hearing aid or a prosthetic limb, then you have experienced cyborgism. It is just a form of human enhancement, technology that is simply designed to improve or heighten your own senses and abilities. This type of technology will enable you to create and recreate a world where the limitations previously imposed by time, space and matter will no longer apply, at least not in the conventional sense. Eventually, you will be able to shape and design your own personal subjectivity and become the architect of your own interpersonal space. Of course, such changes could help to intensify the digital divide, widening the gap that already exists between the information rich and the information poor. However, it is possible that it may also enable face-to-face -face communication to take place on an increasingly global scale. With a relatively cheap VR headset, for instance, it might soon be possible, as Jason Gans explains, for any student anywhere in the world to have access to the same teachers, the same resources, and the same immersive virtual simulations as students in the wealthiest schools. What is that? Is there a shark? Whoa! Whoa! VR will certainly become an important tool for education, often overcoming physical limitations as it allows its users to virtually teleport themselves anywhere in time and space. It is true that levels of surveillance may well become intensified in such a world. If we are always on life, then our digital footprints will always be traceable by others. But as we have seen, new models of surveillance are emerging. Rather than conceive power as residing only in those who do the watching, participatory surveillance sees the individual become involved in a more interactive and reciprocal exchange of information. The ability to create our own unique environments may take this act of empowered participation even further, increasingly enabling us to shapeshift our way through a complex combination of simulation and reality. The dominance of the state will remain, but the heightened interactivity at the heart of immersive media could gradually allow us to resist, reframe and even return its powerful gaze. There are already discussions around VR's ability to build a greater sense of empathy between people, enabling individuals to enter into another person's personal perspective. The ability, for instance, to see and feel the world through the point of view of someone with a physical or mental disability or a different gender, race, age, geographic or economic circumstance could have far-reaching implications on us all. It's not a video game peripheral. It connects humans to other humans in a profound way that I've never seen before in any other form of media. And it can change people's perception of each other. And that's how I think virtual reality has the potential to actually change the world. So it's a machine, but through this machine, we become more compassionate, we become more empathetic, and we become more connected. And ultimately, we become more human. This, then, is the climatic conclusion of selfie culture, a point at which we will begin to be directly and fundamentally involved in the continual construction of the self and the world around us. 
neither wholly real nor entirely simulated, this new hyper-reality will be fraught with dangers, challenges and possibilities. But one thing is abundantly clear. The world will never seem quite the same again. This sort of technology will undoubtedly change us, but we will also play a large role in whether it will enrich or diminish the quality of our lives and the people we become. Whatever these changes bring, it would be foolish to underestimate the revolution that lies ahead. It is easy to mock and criticise selfie culture, but our recent transition from media voyeur to active exhibitionist reveals a significant cultural shift taking place. Marshall McLuhan's notion of the media as an extension of man will seem almost understated in comparison to what is to come, as the screen gradually becomes integrated into the tissue of our DNA and into the very fabric of our being. Our current obsession with self-photography is simply one small step in our long and complex progression towards the screen. Just as the mutoscope and the magic lantern preceded cinema, our new pocket devices may well be part of a much larger technological transformation at work. So, the next time you take a selfie or broadcast yourself live to the world, just remember that you are simply part of a gradual and extraordinary journey into the looking glass. Thank you.